Darwin's theory of natural selection is, of course, very powerful in explaining the evolution of all sorts of interesting traits like camouflage, coloration, and um, just some famous examples. Um, the Patu with her chick here blending into the stick. There's a, um, can you see my pointer where I'm with yes. there? Yeah. Uh, the common barren caterpillar is hiding right in plain sight in the middle of the leaf. And this is a leaf tail gecko over here. So spectacularly beautiful examples of, of camouflage. Uh, but the theory of natural selection alone has a more difficult time explaining animals like the peacock, where the males seem to be doing everything they can to call attention to themselves as much as possible. And so um, the Darwin himself proposed the solution to the problem, which is his theory of sexual selection, um, which proposes that these elaborate traits like the peacock's train and the um, you know, the crest, all of the calls, all the various things that they do um, are about impressing females. And so it's now well established. They improve competition over mates. So it's now well established that the reason that the males have this spectacular train is that peahens demand it. So um, this is a peahen and the peahen is really the artist here who over evolutionary time has been sculpting these spectacular males through their mate choices by selecting the males with the more elaborate displays as mates. Um, but courtship isn't usually just, you know, displaying the train and the female counting eye spots and, and that's it. It's often more like a negotiation than an advertisement. There's a lot of interaction and interplay between the male and the female. Um, and so, just a few of the tasks that both males and females have to do. Um, from a male's perspective, they need to choose a location and a partner for courtship. They need to approach the female and interact appropriately in whatever is appropriate for their species. Um, they need to produce their most attractive display given female preference that might vary across old and young females and in different regions and in response to what other males are doing. And they need to do all that within the bounds of whatever mechanical and energetic constraints they face going into the breeding season. And so these are issues that are faced by not just um, displaying birds like the sage grouse but, um, and the mannequins here, but, um, but fish and peacock spiders and all sorts of species face some a suite of challenges of this kind. And so these are complex tasks and individuals differ in their skill of execution. So their ability to gather information to make choices to approach whatever optimal solution there is to, um, to each of those problems. And so sexual selection may favor not just elaborate traits like the peacock's train, the bright colors and loud sounds, uh, but also behavioral skills. And in this case, social skills um, important for courtship that they need to be successful in actually pulling off courtship. So it's not just about the bright colors, it's about all the other parts of the puzzle that have to come together. Um, and so few studies have been able to really examine this. So there's a lot we don't know about this whole process of sexual selection for social and other kinds of behavioral skills. Um, and the reason that there are few studies is because it's very hard to do. Um, and so just a few of the tasks that we need to do as scientists, you need to be able to collect detailed measurements of what are often subtle male and female behaviors uh, and the social context. If you want to see how individuals are responding to all these things, you have to have good measurements of them. And you need to have some sense of what the optimal, the best behavior is, um, or at least a good measure of fitness. And so fitness from an evolutionary perspective, meaning the number of offspring um, that an individual has, and so the number of genes, or the, the uh, genes that they can pass on in the next generation. And you need to know who is responding to whom in interactions, which is the real tough part. So if you're looking at a male and female interacting with each other and you want to know how skillful one or the other is, 
it's hard to tease that apart because they're two interacting individuals. And so they're responding to each other and they have their own individual skills. Uh, and so it's very hard to tease these things apart. And it requires experiments that allow us to control one side of that interaction or to try to control the social context so that you can really compare individuals and their ability to execute these kinds of tasks. Uh, and so this is something I've been working on for much of my career. So I got started on this as a graduate student studying satin bowerbirds, the spectacular Australian bird. Uh, and I was interested in this interaction between males and females during courtship. And, um, and so I developed this, the world's first female bird robot used for science, <laughs> which is a very, very specific first <laughs> but uh but this is the um the bird that i built to study those courtship interactions um and i could you know place her into the bower where courtship happens and try to tease apart that interaction so i could mimic female signals and see how well males respond to those signals in a controlled way that allows me to compare across males and relate it to their success in courting real females and so only a handful of studies have been able to do this with robotics or video playback or any other kind of method uh, because it's just a very challenging thing to do. So there's still a lot we don't know about the evolution of these kinds of traits by sexual selection. And it's complicated enough when you're dealing with a courtship between um, a male and a female or an interaction between two males or two females, but um, but looking at this in the context in which it occurs in nature is even more challenging. So um, this is especially true in lecking species. So this picture you're seeing is one of the biggest, well, it's probably the biggest lek, uh, sage grouse lek anywhere in the world. It's in Wyoming near where we worked for much of the um, uh, work I'll tell you about today. And the little white dots that you see in the foreground there are the males. And um, there were up to, apparently this lek used to be 600 males. Um, I mean, I, the years that I was working out there, there were 400 males out there. Uh, I think it's down quite a bit from there, but it's still a spectacularly huge lek. And so all of these males are out in this big open area, strutting around impressing females and the females are also out there in the image but they're very hard to see because they blend right into the sagebrush but in that context you have all these males that are displaying and they're trying to attract the female you have females that are often arriving in groups and moving around as groups and it's all happening all at once with everybody interacting together. And so it's even more complex to try to study these kinds of behavioral skills in that context. And so, um, so I'll tell you this evening about some of the work we've been doing, just a snapshot of a few of the projects that we've been working on, using sage grouse as a model system to examine sexual selection on behavioral skills. So really using sage grouse to try to understand these larger processes of sexual selection and how it works on these kinds of behaviors. Um, and, uh, and in particular in male response to female cues and signals during courtship. And then I'll talk a bit about how that basic research, this uh, curiosity-driven research informs our more conservation-focused research. Um, where we've been looking at things like how diet quality and foraging behavior affect courtship and mating success, and more recently, how wildfire impacts foraging, diet, and courtship. And so um, the basic science that we've been doing on the sage grouse informs that conservation work, um, and, and I'll um, give you some examples of that. And so I came at this from the perspective of an evolutionary biologist and animal behaviorist, and I've over time done more and more conservation work, more and more of the students joining my lab want to do work in conservation um, for the obvious reasons that you can imagine that the world is on fire around us. Uh, but in sage grouse in particular, when I got started working on sage grouse, I was really 
drawn to the system because they're spectacular and wonderful to study for sexual selection. But um, once I got started working on the sage grouse and became more aware of the conservation situation, more and more of the work in my lab has shifted in that direction. And so the status of sage grouse, uh, the greater sage grouse, their populations have declined by up to 95% from what we estimate the populations were when Lewis and Clark first um, described them for Western science. Uh, and so they've they were estimated to be around 16 million, and there's now 200 to 500,000 birds. That number fluctuates a lot. Their populations swing around a lot. Um, so there's still quite a few birds out there, but the numbers are, whoops, the numbers are uh, declining pretty alarmingly. And they've lost about 56% of their habitat. So they are very widely distributed across the interior west and the sagebrush sea. Um, but their, their um, actual range is in green there. And it's only 56% of that, um, uh, or I guess 44% <laughs> of that original range. Um, and so they are not currently listed as an endangered species, but they've been considered for listing uh, many times, I think nine or 10 times at this point. Um, and they're, so they're not listed now, but if they are listed, if they become listed, it would affect about 65 million acres in 11 states. So it would have dramatic impacts on land use across a lot of the interior West. And so, as you can imagine, it's a politically, uh, tough issue. It would have major impacts. Um, and so there have been, it's arguably the biggest single species conservation effort in US history, second to the bald eagle. Um, but as far as money and manpower invested, I think it's arguably the biggest um, to avoid needing to list them. So seeing this problem coming as the population trajectories decline and trying to try, you know, trying to do the right thing by stopping it before it gets to the point of them being endangered. Um, and so there's been some mixed success. We can talk about that in questions afterwards if you have more questions about it, but um, but it would be a big deal if they were listed and um, and yeah. I have mixed feelings about all that. We can talk, talk about later if you're interested. Um, let me get this bar out of the way so I can see my slide. There we go. But there's still a lot we don't know about how to stop the decline. So there's been a lot of research and a lot of conservation work, um, but there's still a, an amazing amount that we don't know about um, what causes declines, why we have some populations crashing and others that seem to be stable. Um, and what makes good sage grouse habitat? There, um, what is it about some areas that's, that make them so much better to support populations? And how do we restore habitat once it's been degraded? So there are some big questions out there that are still important. And so we've been doing this work. Uh, much of it is in Lander, Wyoming, um, or outside of Lander, Wyoming, which is one of the areas where the birds are locally abundant. So, um, so they're still fairly easy to see and study. And this area is just right on the east side of the Wind River Range, which is just a gorgeous uh, slice of the Rocky Mountains. And more recently, we've been working in the Eastern Sierra near Mono Lake around Lee Vining area and Bodie Hills, if you're familiar with that spot. Also spectacular place to work. And most recently, we've had a project in the Santa Rosa Mountains of Nevada, which is also a beautiful place to work. Um, so yeah, one of the great things about studying sage grouse is just getting to go to these amazing places and getting to know them. And so this is our longest term field site in Wyoming. We were out there for 13 years. Um, each spring, we were out there for um, two to three months studying these birds. And we would set up this camp in the middle of nowhere um, near where our study leks were. So this is chicken camp, as it was called by the locals. 
And uh, we would stay out there with all of our trucks and gear near the leks because they are very hard to access when the weather gets bad. And so we wanted to be as close as we could so that we could get there through the mud or snow or whatever else. And we were out there with field crews every year. So for those 13 years, we had lots and lots of crews. This was a particularly epic field crew photo. Um, lots of people that came and helped us collect the data. And then we would come back to the, um, to the lab with hours and hours of video and audio recordings. And we had over 300 undergraduates over the years who worked in my lab and helping to analyze and extract data from these video and audio recordings. So a lot of help. And so we were out there studying the sage grouse. So this is one morning on the sage grouse leg. Now it is in normal speed. And we that up so you can see one whole morning. And the key thing here is that there are nails in the middle and they're surrounded by it. And Almost all of those hens you know, want to make in the middle. So you see a lot of other males kind of hanging out, fighting and talking with each other. Most of them will not mate up just because in the middle. So this all takes place over a matter of a few hours every morning during the breeding season, which lasts two, three months. But most of the activity is within a matter of a week or two where almost all the mating happens. Um, so the end that day ended when a, a harrier flew over the leg and spooked them all off at the end. And so um, usually there's just a few males that are doing almost all the mating. The females raise the young on their own. So it's a really interesting breeding system that leads to some pretty extreme behaviors from the males to be the uh, successful male. So this is a, um, a slow-mo video of a male display, 250 frames per second. So you can really see what's happening here. So the first part of the clip will show the male in real time as he's doing this sort of they watch run across the snow is how I visualize this, but um, but he's going to run out and then do his big strut display. And you'll start out, um, you'll hear another male in the background at first, but then you'll see him. He's going to start out by doing a swishing sound of his wings across the feathers on his chest, which makes a shh kind of sound. They'll do that a few times and then they'll produce this vocalization uh, that radiates from their vocal sacs. So they have two vocal sacs on their chest um, and the sound radiates from the vocal sacs rather than from their bill. So it's a very unusual display. So first in real time and then slow-mo. You can hear another male in the background there. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's deeply weird and unbird-like in many ways. Um, it doesn't sound like most any other birds that you, <laughs> you will find. Um, and the, the mechanical sound is really, it's stridulation, just similar to a cricket that's, you know, um, rubbing a file across a plectrum to make a little vibration sound. So that's a mechanical sound produced by the feathers, followed by this vocalization that has a very, very specific anatomy um, to the greater sage grouse. So whoops, here we go again. Um, and so we'll start out just talking a little bit more about the, um, the basic science side and then back to the conservation. So before we talk about sexual selection, just again to emphasize how interesting these systems are and why sexual selection is so extreme. 
So this photo is one that I took on the lek on the peak day of breeding. So much of the mating happens in a really fairly short window, and there's often just one day of chaos. Um, and that was this day on this lek. So this is 2014, and this male in the middle is a, sort of our all-time mating champion male who just totally dominated breeding that year. Um, and so we monitored him throughout the breeding season and um, and over the three months, or I guess it's, we monitor for about two and a half months, he made it over 130 times. And, um, and within that, almost all of that mating happened within about a week. And they're on the lek for just a few hours every morning. And so this morning when I was out there on the lek, I watched him mate 30, uh, eight times that morning. So 38 times that that morning and 23 of those matings happened in a 23 minute long period of time where he just mated once a minute for 23 straight minutes with different hens, as far as I could tell. Um, so it was pretty impressive. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty extraordinary thing. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the point being that the payoff in terms of evolutionary fitness of passing genes onto the next generation for being the desirable popular male of the year is enormous. So there is very strong sexual selection to be him. And so that is why we end up with these just extraordinarily weird and elaborate displays in the males. And this is also why we have peacocks and um, and the mannequins and birds of paradise, so many of the most spectacular bird species um, that we all love um, are lecking species like this, where they have these um, extreme skews in mating, where just a few individuals are doing most of the mating and there's very strong selection to be sexy for the males. So what do we know about sexual selection and what females are actually looking for in a mate? Um, we know that they're extremely picky. As I said, they almost all want to mate with the same individuals. Um, but it doesn't seem to be about looks in it. That doesn't mean looks don't matter, but it doesn't seem to be central to mating success. So as far as what people have been able to measure over the years of study since the 1970s, successful males show up and work hard. Those are the first two things. So they have a high quantity of display. So the number of days they spend on the lek during the breeding season, and then when they're there, how much they're strutting. So the successful guys are just there strutting all morning long. Um, and then the quality of their strut. So there's particular aspects of the sound of the vocalization that they make that females seem to care about. It's a very particular measurement that you can make on the the vocalization that we can't even really hear the difference between attractive and unattractive males um, and so those are the things that seem to matter the displays we know from previous studies are energetically costly so the males um, are powered by sagebrush and they are out there for hours at a time doing this um, sometimes in the brutal cold where well we're you know, in thick down jackets, shivering, and they're out there running around dancing. Um, so it's it's a pretty amazingly, um, yeah, it, it takes a lot of energy to do what these guys do. So we know it's energetically costly. And so previous studies suggested this sort of trade-off between quantity and quality. And quantity, quality trade-offs are very common in everything, including evolutionary biology. So you can either do something a lot or do it well, but it's very hard to do both of those things, right? To maximize both at the same time. And so one of the first things I got interested in in studying the system was to try to see how birds might manage that quantity quality trade-off. So the first study, which I'm just gonna give you a quick summary of, um, we examined whether males manage this trade-off by being tactical about how they use their energy. So using their energy when it's most likely to actually lead to matings. And based on past research, um, it suggested that that's when the females are close. So basically when a female is up close with a male, that's when strutting at a high rate uh, is the most important. And so we expected the males to really ramp up their strutting when the female is close. 
And by doing that, they can avoid this quantity quality trade-off because they're not always at maximum quantity. They're just adjusting it right when it matters the most. So that's what we set out to test was whether that was happening. Um, and we wanted to know whether males respond to female presence on the lek, whether they're females present or absent, and then their proximity. So how close they are to the male. And so this is where this was the first generation robotic female sage grouse and um, it's fairly primitive, but good enough. Um, and so she was on G scale model train tracks and um, it's a, you know, this was my first attempt at taxidermy a sage grouse, so it's not my best work. Um, but she has a little microphone on the top and a little video camera embedded in the front. And we can send her out onto the lek where males are displaying, and it allows us to control for female presence. Um, we're basically comparing males across a level playing field. We know the female they're recording, and we can control her proximity to the males and see how the males adjust their behavior in response to that. And so you may be wondering, do they fall for this because she doesn't have legs and she's on train tracks and she has a microphone? Um, and yes, they did. Um, so the males in lecking species are not very picky. <laughs> so they're not investing a lot in this relationship. Um, as you saw from my uh, photo there, he made it 23 times in 23 minutes. So his, you know, he, he invests more than just one minute <laughs> in that female. There's a lot of courtship that leads up to that, but, um, but it's not as if he's picking a, a long-term partner like an albatross where they're both very much a assessing each other and making a good choice. Um, if males, sage grouse are not very picky. And so when there are no real females or robotic females on the lek, we often see them trying to actually mate with dried cow pies and all sorts of other things out there because they're just really keyed up and ready to mate. Um, so it's fairly easy to fool them, which is why I've done all of this work with robotic females in lecking species. It would be very hard to fool males from a monogamous species where they were paying attention to <laughs> who they were investing their courtship effort in. Um, so, whoops, I should introduce this. So this is a video clip from on board this first generation robot. Um, and uh, so again, she had the video camera. And so this is gonna show her moving out onto the lek interacting with a male. So that was our very first experiment with the robot and um, and it ended in a way that I think was worth it for the video because it's been very fun to have that video but um, but we learned a lot about how to um, to do these experiments without that happening. <laughs> we also watched that same male when real females would show up in his territory he would come barreling over to them way too fast and they would not let him get anywhere near them. They just <laughs> left his territory very quickly. So he, yes, was clearly lacking, lacking social skills. Um, and so what did we find with that first experiment? Again, just giving you this sort of very short version of this. Um, and uh, so we found that males adjust their display effort in response to female presence and proximity. So there are uh, more responsive males can increase quantity without declines in quality and are more successful. So in other words, these top males aren't just always strutting at their maximum level. They turn it down when there aren't females around. And as the female gets closer, they ramp it up more and more. And by doing that, they don't show that quantity quality trade off. Whereas these unsuccessful males are just sort of blasting away at a mediocre level all the time. And so when they do need to turn it up, their quality declines. And so that was the, the pattern that we saw. And that suggests that their sexual selection on this, this particular social skill, this courtship skill, um, which is 
allocating their effort when it's most likely to lead to matings. And so the males that were better at this were more successful at convincing real females to mate um, because they could put on a better show. And this is work that I did with my former postdoc, Alan Krakauer, who was a part of a lot of the research I'll tell you about today, and who also gives a great talk about um, the sort of cooperative kin selected courtship displays in turkeys, which is seasonally appropriate. So I can give you his information if you're interested. He, he gives a great talk. Um, and so uh, the next question after studying this particular um, behavioral skill was whether males are also responding to female signals and cues. So besides just presence and proximity, are they also paying attention to what the females are doing? and signals and cues they might be producing. And so this is work done with my graduate student, Anna Perry, uh, as part of her dissertation research. And so, um, so she started out by studying female behaviors on the LEC and trying to really pin down um, how female behaviors relate to their probability of mating. Uh, and so she's, these are two images of a female foraging across the lek, and she looked at the probability that females who are foraging will transition to actually soliciting a mating, and females that are spending more time upright looking around will transition to mating. And she found that um, females who are foraging are pretty unlikely to decide to mate that day. Um, whereas a female who is spending more time upright and sort of in the general direction of a male is much more likely to decide to actually mate with him. Uh, and this is something that we have seen out there for all the years we've been on the sage grouse lek is most of the time when females are walking across the lek, they're just foraging around on the ground as if they just happen to be there eating. Um, but they're they're not just there eating, they're, um, they're foraging particularly around males that they're interested in mating with. So they're checking them out and gathering information while they're foraging. Um, and so there's information there in the female behavior about the likelihood that she's actually gonna mate with a male. And that's what we wanted to know. Can he learn something by paying attention to his, her behavior that might affect how he invests his effort in courting particular females or which females to court? So we asked, do males respond to differences in female behavior that indicate this interest or lack of interest in mating? And then we asked who adjusts more, successful or unsuccessful males? So we can imagine that that could go either direction, actually. Um, the, either the most successful males are um, paying the most attention to these signals or the least successful males paying most attention to these signals. And, um, and so to test this, I had to build a better robot. And so um, I worked with engineers to do the electronics on all of these things and uh, mechanical engineers to get some of the movements right. And then they sent this out into the field and I tried to make it look like a bird. And so um, it was a long-term sort of twisted arts and crafts project um, that I did at a little bench in Wyoming. And so this is, what it starts out looking like an escaped rotisserie chicken <laughs> that can drive around. Um, and then I just use whatever I could find. I use a lot of arts and crafts materials, a lot of trips to Walmart, getting various materials and craft glue and anything else. Um, I used a pair of Spanx to get the neck right, like just, you know, heavy duty um, nylons anything. Uh, and so in the end, they they turned out pretty good. I, I'm getting better at taxidermy with every iteration of this. So um, so these were the next generation of robot and um, and there are two of them. So um, I, don't, I won't have time to tell you about all the different experiments, but we've done some experiments with two robots at once to give the male a choice between two females. And we can have her do these different behaviors that are associated with either interested or uninterested in mating. So uninterested is when the females are on the left foraging around. So she can tilt forward and peck at the ground uh, and um, look around. And we're able to drive her out onto the left. We don't have to set up train tracks, which is nice. Um, so we can send her out in a sort of predetermined course onto the left. Uh, and then if the female's interested, then she's spending more time upright and sort of looking around in the general direction when a male is there. 
I was trying to drive and film at the same time, so the camera work is not my best, but. Uh, but so she looks much more realistic and can imitate these behaviors of interest. And so we tested 52 males on three leks with these robots. Um, and we tested them with a female looking interested or uninterested. We also looked at their behavior towards real females and when there's no females around. And as with the first robot, we did the same test on the first robot, but there's there's very little difference between the male's behavior towards the robotic female and a real female. So if we measure his strutting effort and behavior towards the robot, it's a very good predictor of what he'll do when a real female shows up. So um, it's eliciting a natural behavior from the males. So what did we find? We found that um, when we looked at our measure of courtship efforts, um, which I won't get into the details of, of that, but, um, but this is our measure of courtship effort, of strutting effort and, um, and strutting for longer periods of time and at more intense rate. Uh, and then this is the number of matings on the um, vertical axis. And it's also color coded, which you'll see on the next slides as well. And so the key thing here is that as effort increases, males that are putting in more of an effort are mating more. But um, so we know that females like high effort displays. That has been known for a long time, and our studies have found that same pattern. But despite that preference for high effort displays, they're just they're not always cranking out courtship displays at their highest rate. And so um, looking at how they allocate that effort um, with uh, females in towards the robotic females. So if we look uh, at their effort towards, um, towards display when there are no females around versus when there's a robot around, um, you can see the successful males display more with the robot present and less when the robot is absent than unsuccessful males. And so there's a negative relationship here. So males that are strutting the most when there's a robot present um, are actually strutting the least when there are no females around. And the males, again, that are just sort of mediocre, not very successful in mating, are just kind of blasting away around the middle here, not really making any adjustments. But the successful guys, the ones that are mating a lot, are down here where they're cranking it up to a very high rate when there's a female there and toning it down when there are no females around. And then there's that guy, because there's always one guy who does not do what <laughs> everybody else does. But um, And so this is similar to what we found in that first experiment that I just briefly summarized. We found that same basic pattern and then we wanted to look at how they respond to female signals. So that was just presence or absence, but how about their response to the uninterested or interested signals? And so here, um, using uninterested as sort of the baseline, um, and we looked at their um, change in effort with the treatment. And what you can see is that on average, males are increasing their effort during interactions with the interested females. So in general, they're cranking it up when there's a female who's showing signs of being actually interested in mating. So she's spending more time upright looking around rather than foraging at the lek. But there's a lot of variability among males in how they do this. And so we wanted to know whether more successful males were responding more or whether unsuccessful males were responding more. Um, and it turned out that the unsuccessful males were actually the ones that were making bigger adjustments in their display effort. And so unsuccessful males were biasing their effort more than successful males, um, whereas the successful males were more consistent. And so this was one of the hypotheses that we set out to test, one of the possibilities that we predicted could happen, which is that these successful males, if there is a female out there and she has approached him, they just go for it because they have a better chance of convincing the female to mate that day or a different day. Whereas the unsuccessful males are, are um, really investing only if the female is showing signs that she's actually gonna mate with him. So they're the ones that are saving their energy more um, in this particular case. So it's a different kind of skill and response than we saw in the first experiment. 
So it's consistent with one of our alternative hypotheses that the less successful males are more energetically constrained and invest their energy courting females that are more likely to actually mate. Whereas the successful guys, if she's interested enough to approach him, will just go for it. And so in sage grouse, successful and unsuccessful males might have different tactics in response to these um, female signals is what our results suggested. And so measuring these courtship tactics relative to their fitness, their um, success in mating, we gain this more complete picture of how sexual selection acts on displays. Um, and how it may favor behavioral skills. So not just the spectacular um, plumage and phyllo plumes and combs and vocal sacs and everything else, but also how they allocate their effort and focus their attention as they're um, deciding how to use their energy to, uh, to mate as often as possible. And so these results also suggest that acquiring and using energy is an important determinant of courtship success in sage grouse. So how they use and invest their energy is a big part of what makes some birds successful and others not. And so that leads into our more conservation focused research, which is really connected diet to their courtship and mating behaviors. And so um, in our experiments with the robot, uh, Anna found that males show this dramatic seasonal decline in display effort. So if you look at that metric of courtship effort that we use, whoops, um, other way, metric of courtship effort that we used um, on the vertical axis, uh, and then we have the number of days after the peak of breeding. So this is sort of as the breeding season is continuing, they're declining their courtship effort as the season continues. They're getting tired, basically. So their odds of continuing a, a bout of courtship display decrease by like 6% per day. So they're just slowing down as the season progresses. Um, and you can see here, this is when there's no females around. Um, when we're just measuring their display effort, when there's no females around, it's also declining. And then when you look at their behavior towards a real female or an interested robot, you see that they're very similar display efforts, but it's also declining throughout the season. So again, they're just, they're getting tired. So taken together um, with, with uh, results from previous studies, it suggests that the acquisition and use of energy is critical in being able to produce these attractive displays. And the energy comes from diet, and diet is sagebrush during most of the winter that the males are out here doing this. Their diet is almost exclusively sagebrush. And the diet quality differs with habitat quality and their ability to find good food, so their foraging success. And so what makes high quality diet? So this is work done by our collaborator, Jennifer Forby from Boise State University, a long-term collaborator. And she's been looking at um, how the birds are choosing. So like a lot of herbivore specialists, including things like koalas, you know, like specialists, animals that specialize on eating a particular plant. Um, and many of those plants are toxic but they have evolved the ability to eat them, to, to deal with the toxins. And sage grouse, that is true for sage grouse. They can eat sagebrush, which is filled with toxins, um, because, but they're extremely picky in how they do it. So um, just like a koala, they're surrounded by eucalyptus, but they will only eat a small fraction of what you give them. And the sage grouse are the same way. So they're surrounded by sagebrush, but it is not all equal in terms of its dietary quality. And so Jen looked at what plants the birds were eating and found that, um, that the plants that they were eating, so the browsed plants, so she, we go out to these locations and you look for bite marks on the leaves of the sagebrush and you can see what plants they're actually eating. And the ones that were browsed, so they were consumed by the birds, had low concentrations of toxins and high protein value compared to uh, non-browsed plants within that same area, so the plants that they avoid, and compared to just random locations that they could go. So they're being very selective and going to patches. And then within the patch, they're finding the plants that have the lowest toxicity and highest protein. 
And so um, they're being very choosy. And, um, and we know that protein and toxicity value, uh, vary across the sagebrush subspecies and the age of the plant, soil type, precipitation, aspect, you name it. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why this varies a great deal across plant to plant and across the landscape. And so we've been looking at how foraging behaviors relate to diet quality and then how diet quality relates to components of fitness. In our population in Wyoming, Jen has been doing this in her population in Idaho. Um, we've done this in our work in Nevada and in California as well. So we have lots of different sites that have um, variation in sagebrush species and toxicity and all sorts of things. And we're doing comparative studies across all of them. And so at these different sites, we've been mapping where the birds are going. So we're seeing what patches they're visiting using these GPS tags um, where we can download data from satellites and figure out where the birds have been going. And we can map out how they're spending their time. So these, this is just one map of two days of the life of one of our birds. And you can see that he spends some time there on the lek. And then at night, he had these particular roost spite, uh, spots where he would spend the night. And then during the day, he would visit particular areas for foraging. So we would get these data and then go out to that spot the next day. So we'd figure out where he was the day before, go out to that spot, and then uh, sample the plants. And so this was a particularly fun day. We did this in the Eastern Sierra and the Long Valley area. And, um, and you, you know, when there's snow on the ground, it's so cool because you get, you navigate out there on the GPS. And when you get there, there's footprints on the ground. Uh, and you can actually see exactly what the birds did. You can see they're, they're walking around often in a little bit of a group. They'll walk around up to one sagebrush plant and you'll see like a single bite mark or two on the leaf of the plant. And then they walk away from it and go to the next one. And then the next plant they'll, you know, eat all over the plant. So they're being very picky. You can sort of see the track of their pickiness there. Uh, and so we are looking for bite marks on the plants. So we spend a lot of time looking up close at sagebrush plants for bite marks. Um, and this is what they look like. Uh, we can tell the difference between sage grouse bite marks and the bite marks of other little herbivores out there. And so once we do that, we can collect vegetation. So we collect plant samples from the plants that are being eaten and the plants that are not being eaten. Um, we can collect any scat samples that we find out there, or we can look at um, metabolites of detoxification as well as stress associated hormones. And so we, all these plant samples have been analyzed in the Forby lab now. And my graduate student, Eric Timestra up at the top there has been analyzing all the results. And I don't yet have the final story for you, but, <laughs> but we're working on it right now, trying to connect all that diet data to their foraging behavior. Um, and in particular, one of the things we really want to know is whether males that are more efficient at foraging and finding good food are also better at the tactics on the lack of courting females. So connecting back that conservation related question to the basic science. Um, but this work is important for understanding what makes good sagebrush habitat at the chemical level. Uh, because again, there's sagebrush everywhere, and yet it does not all seem to be able to support healthy sage grouse populations. And so understanding what makes good habitat comes down to the chemistry, and there's still a lot we don't know about what they're choosing for. And so uh, our initial interest in diet was to understand how this energy affects male tactics on the lek, so connecting back to the basic science, um, and then to understand links between behavioral skills and courtship and foraging. And uh, they'll also be relevant to conservation, so efforts to identify and protect critical sage grouse habitat, and then efforts to restore degraded habitat um, are hindered by our lack of understanding about what makes good habitat for the birds. And so our studies are trying to get at that at that chemical level. So linking diet differences to fitness outcomes, their success at actually breeding. And our most recent studies have been focused on the impacts of fire. 
Um, so my graduate student, Maria Ospina, has been doing this work in the Sierra, um, the Santa Rosa Mountains in Nevada. Um, so restoration is becoming more critical as we're learning, losing more and more of the sagebrush landscape to fire. So um, this, you know, with drought and invasive grasses, the cheat grass that adds fuel, uh, millions of acres of sagebrush have been lost in the last decade alone. And so we've been working at a site of the Nevada uh, Martin fire in 2018, which destroyed 440,000 acres of critical sagebrush habitat in a matter of days. So 35 leks of habitat just gone in four days, um, which was pretty extraordinary. The a local biologist had spent years um, working on keeping this habitat healthy and then just like that. Um, drunken idiots with fireworks. <laughs> it sort of unrolled all of that effort. Um, and the image you can see on the bottom here is just a picture that I took from the top of a ridge. And it's kind of hard to tell, but looking out across that landscape, there is no sagebrush. That would have been sagebrush as far as you can see. And right now it's bare dirt and mostly cheat grass. So it was a vast, vast area of um, habitat lost. And so we've been looking at how wildfire and restoration affect their diet quality and where they're foraging, how they're moving around, and then their behaviors on the lek. And so um, this is just a picture from out there. You can see there's little islands of sagebrush remaining out there, um, but for the most part, it's a sea of cheat grass. Um, and so we can sort of map out where these islands are and we're using these satellite tags to monitor the movement of the birds between these islands. Um, and part of that is understanding how they're using what's left so that we can better and more effectively restore the habitat. And so as these populations decline, our work has focused more on conservation, but we're still using what we've learned from the basic animal behavior studies and, um, and looking at their behaviors on the leg and their fitness. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, exciting work out there. We have learned to get every type of vehicle stuck in every type of situation. It's a, <laughs> it's a challenging landscape to work in that time of the year, right when the snow is melting into mud. Uh, but we've been working closely with the wildlife managers and policymakers to try to uh, inform their restoration efforts with recommendations. So uh, the sage grouse have been important in uh, as a model system in evolutionary and behavioral biology for decades. So we have learned a lot from these birds over the many years of studying them. This is a magazine cover from 1932, and I just love that it looks just like that guy. Uh, so we've been studying the behavior of these birds for a very long time, and, um, and humans have been studying these birds for a very, very long time. So there's um, this is a dance of the local Shoshone tribe that's a chicken dance that includes uh, sage grouse tail feathers in the bustle. Um, and they were an important food source and um, and their display behaviors were an important part of the cultural heritage. And, um, and you can see some of the sage grouse and prairie chicken behaviors in the dances at powwows. So they've been important um, in, you know, to humans for a very long time and their landscape is changing dramatically. So this photo is taken from one of the energy, the sites where I studied the impact of energy development noise on the birds. This was one of the best patches of habitat and now it's a, a massive oil and gas field and the bird populations have crashed. So understanding how they use an undisturbed habitat helps us predict and counteract the effects of, of human impacts on the habitat. And that includes grazing, um, the energy development. This is an aerial view of that oil and gas field. Solar panels are coming in there too. Uh, wind farms are being developed in sage grouse habitat. And all these things are gonna have an impact. And so trying to understand the bird's behavior better so that we can minimize that impact um, while doing necessary things um, is very important. And, um, and you know, understanding the impacts of things like the invasive grasses and wildfire as well. And so, yeah, 
with that, I'll just thank all the various people who supported the work and helped along the way and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that interesting talk. We have just a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Larry. Yeah, I, uh, can you hear me here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, yeah, one of the things that uh, you know, I noticed when you're talking about the successful males and you said you had done this over a period of 13 years, were you able to identify like uh, individual birds and monitor say their their um, behavior from year to year that maybe some of the unsuccessful males one year became more successful the next year and so on and so forth that they kind of, you might say, grew up and learned the skills to uh, to, to attract mates. Were you able to do anything? Um, I yeah. really wish we had been able to, um, to do all of that. We can recognize them within a breeding season by their plumage. So I don't have a good picture of it, but um, when the male turns his backside to us, um, there's a, a pattern of plumage that we can recognize them as individuals, but only within a season. The next year they come back and they've molted their feathers and, and we can't recognize them anymore. Uh, and so tracking them year to year, we were only able to do that on the birds that we had captured and put the GPS tags on and had color bands on them. But otherwise we really tried to minimize our impact on them. And it, it's a big impactful thing to capture them on the lek. And so, um, so we really tried to minimize that and that limited our ability to, to look at the kinds of questions like you said, but um, the first year from what I have seen, the very first year out there, they're not very good. <laughs> they're really, um, they try, but you know, depending on exactly how old they are when they join the LEC, they either, you can tell they're just their muscle physiology hasn't fully developed. And in other cases, they just, they, they get chased left and right. The real, the adult males don't allow them to get a territory. Um, and so usually it's going to be the second or possibly third year males that are going to be successful. Um, and so that top guy, um, the next year, uh, we're not 100% certain, but we're pretty sure that the guy that um, that took over the top spot the next year was the same male, but he was not anywhere near as successful. And so um, it's not always going to increase with age. I think he probably had a great year and then the next year was still recovering from it, <laughs> from, <laughs> from his just year of glory. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I, my sense is that there's probably some improvement um, and some males might get a little bit better. I, we had some males around the lek for four years. They did not tend to be the most successful ones. So um, I don't think, I think there's some learning, but it's not as critical. The bowerbirds I studied spent seven years learning how to be an adult male before they attempted courtship on a female. And they, they, they had this whole apprenticeship. I mean, it was an amazing long-term process and the sage grouse are on the other end of that extreme of <laughs> short lives. Um, and they're kind of ready to go right when they, <laughs> when they get there. But that's a great question. I wish I, I wish I knew the answer more. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Has anyone gotten to see them in the wild, on the lek, or anywhere? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, over by Mono Lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, the leks near Mammoth are pretty well known to be accessible. Uh, they're right near a hot spring. So we had some camera traps out by those leks and we would get an occasional people coming and going from the hot spring at sunrise <laughs> on our camera traps. That, um, so it, yeah, there's a few spots that you can still see them out there. Great, and any other questions? Okay, since we're running over time, I guess we'll call it quits at this point. We wanna thank Dr. Patrick Kelly for a wonderful lecture, really interesting. And um, we hope to hear from you again sometime. Keep us informed with what you're doing. Yeah. Everyone remember that we have a trip on the 29th out to Merced that you're welcome to join us on. All right. 1145. <laughs> Okay, so with that, I guess we'll call it a night. Thank you again. Good night, everyone. Yeah.
Thanks. Good to meet you all. You too.